Let me start by recognizing the death of Travis Roy, who unfortunately passed away this week. In fact, he chose to spend the last days of his life at his camp in Mallets Bay. This says a lot about how he felt about Vermont. I last saw Travis about a year ago when he spoke at an event in Burlington. I've known him for quite some time, as his dad was a UVM grad and hockey player and was involved with stock car racing in the Northeast. I had read Travis's book, but never heard him personally tell his story until last year. And I was so inspired after hearing him. Enough so that I spoke about him in my last State of the State address. I'd like to share a bit of that today because I think we could all use some inspiration during these difficult times and help put things in perspective. I said, his talent was recognized at a young age. Hockey was his life, and he was destined for the NHL. 24 years ago, he played exactly 11 seconds for Boston University before going headfirst into the boards, and then instantly found himself unable to move from the neck down. Travis spent every moment since ensuring those 11 seconds to find an opportunity, not a tragedy. As a result, he changed the way his sport is taught. Through his efforts at places like Little Fenway in Essex, he's raised millions for spinal cord research and adaptive equipment. He shared his story and found his purpose in helping others find theirs. Travis said, there are times when we choose our challenges and other times when our challenges simply choose us. It's what we do in the face of those challenges that defines who we are. Those words mean more to me today than ever. The world certainly could use a few more role models like Travis Roy these days. And I'm saddened to lose one of my heroes. I send my condolences to his family, friends, and the many, many lives he touched. Next, I want to cover an issue that I'm sure is on the minds of many, a cyber attack on the IT system at the UVM Health Network. This has created a significant disruption for many of their facilities, and we're working closely with UVMMC to ensure patient safety. Our Department of Public Safety, alongside state and federal law enforcement, are working together to give support and to determine whether it's connected to other similar events throughout the country. There has been no known impact to the state IT system, and the Agency of Digital Services is continuing its everyday work to protect our IT network. I also want to assure Vermonters that we've been working around the clock and have taken several steps to ensure there is no interruption to our COVID testing. My team has done a great job, and I'm confident we'll keep this process moving and maybe even improving it. As I said on Tuesday, we'll be detailing the recent hockey outbreak so we can help Vermonters understand how it was spread. Mr. Pichek and Dr. Kelso will provide a closer look at these cases, which will show how one event can turn one case into many. As well, Dr. Levine will talk about cases in schools for our weekly education update. And on that topic, I also want to note that we have winter sports guidance nearly finalized, and we'll be releasing that next week. Secretary French is on the line for questions as well. Before I turn it over to Dr. Kelso and Commissioner Pichek, I want to reiterate some of what we said earlier this week. Like much of the region and country, we are seeing cases grow here in Vermont. While our positivity rates and total case counts remain among the lowest in the country and hospitalization still remains low, no one wants to see a rise in cases. Fortunately, as we've moved through the week, the number of daily cases has slowed down. But after seeing this week's model, projecting the possibility of 50 new cases a day by mid-November, we have to keep an eye on things. I want to be clear. We have the tracing and testing capacity 
to manage our way through these ty types of upticks. But we also need the help of all of you to mitigate this. I have two observations from the last couple of weeks. And if we can be mindful of them, we can control our destiny, just like we did last spring. First, as Dr. Levine has said, we're seeing pandemic fatigue. People are tired of having to be so careful all the time, whether it's the travel restrictions or everyday social lives. It's just not as easy to get out and spend time with others as it was before the pandemic or even during the good weather winter or good weather months. And it seems as though we're getting to the point where after eight months, when more people are willing to take more risks. I get it. I really do. But we must stay vigilant. The second is that our success in suppressing the virus has caused some to become more complacent. And I get that as well. What you've done over the last several months allowed us to take many steps forward and methodically reopen. However, if we want to keep our schools and economy open, we need to double down on our efforts to contain this virus. That means masking up, keeping six feet apart, washing your hands, keeping social gatherings small and just amongst those you trust, especially as we move indoors, and make sure you follow our travel guidance. Since the start of this pandemic, Vermonters have stepped up to this challenge and we suppress the virus, even below the best case scenarios that have been modeled in the spring. I'm confident we can do it again, especially now with all we've learned. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek and Dr. Kelso. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Kelso and I will provide an overview of the uh, recent outbreak uh, in central Vermont. Uh, I'll start with a play-by-play -play of where we stand, uh, where the cases started, how they spread. And then Dr. Kelso will follow up with um, some insights into lessons learned, uh, behaviors that may have attributed to the outbreak and to the spread, um, and then uh, where we go uh, from here. Generally, you'll see from the outbreak that, as the governor said, just a few cases can really spark uh, a whole bunch of new and additional cases, uh, not just the sheer number of those cases, but also spreading across a wide geographic area. So again, all the more reason, I think, after a result of this presentation that in individuals follow those public health guidelines uh, closely and think about that the impact that even a small uh, behavior can have on a large group of people and on different communities as well. First, just to begin, you'll see that um, you know cases grow, going growing quickly is not unique to Vermont. It's not unique even to the region. Uh, we see just last night that the United States passed nine million new cases. Uh, this is uh, notable not just for an additional million cases being added to our total, but that this was the quickest we added a million cases since the start of the pandemic, uh, just 13 days. Uh, similarly, cases are on the rise in the region. New Hampshire and Maine have surpassed their highest seven-day uh, average since the beginning of the pandemic as well. If we go ahead to the next slide, we'll show just a brief overview of a past outbreak walkthrough that we did uh, at the end of September. This was the main wedding uh, that resulted uh, in 180 cases, unfortunately resulted in eight fatalities, and also had a wide geographic distribution across the state. Here, the outbreak fortunately is better contained. There's less number of cases, and those cases have not gone at this point to vulnerable populations. So we fortunately do not have any fatalities related to the central Vermont outbreak. The age of those in that outbreak tend to be younger. There have been a lot of uh, students impacted that are quite young or in college. So that certainly is a main difference from the cases that we presented uh, just a month ago in Maine. But as Dr. Kelso will point out, some of the risk factors that led to this outbreak in Maine are not all that much different than what may have happened here in Vermont, including uh, lax mask wearing, uh, complacency by individuals, uh, and some of those things that we hear about uh, quite frequently. 
Turning now to an overview of the summary uh, of this case, we see that there are currently 89 total cases now associated with the central Vermont outbreak, including 18 different towns throughout Vermont, uh, impacting four different counties. Similarly, the outbreak led to four additional outbreaks, although much smaller in size, except for the larger outbreak at St. Michael's College, uh, where there are now 41 cases with an additional six reported yesterday. Further, even though not outbreaks, there were exposures at 19 other locations, including work sites and schools. So there was obviously wide disruption, not just for those that uh, had uh, an actual outbreak, but for many different locations where there was an individual infectious um, at a particular location uh, throughout this current outbreak. And maybe just as um, concerning as Dr. Levine has mentioned in the past, and I'm sure Dr. Kelsey will mention, 473 uh, total contacts to date associated with this outbreak. So certainly a monumental task for the epidemiological team and Dr. Kelso's team uh, to um, reach out to all of those impacted and get this uh, outbreak uh, contained and under control. The first case that we saw reported was way back 23 days ago on October 7th. The initial two cases reported in central Vermont, both cases ended up being associated with sports leagues uh, in central Vermont, associated with the Central Vermont Memorial Civic Center, which then closed for cleaning. Those two cases then turned into 13 uh, just a few days later. Connecting these cases identified further to the sports leagues that occurred in central Vermont. The teams were then notified, uh, sent a notice out to the players, and the Vermont Department of Health contact tracers started to reach out to all of the players uh, on the league rosters. Those 13 cases, again, you can see them spread out not just in central Vermont, but down into the Upper Valley and into the Chittenden County, County area as well. Uh, making for a wider you know, distribution of geographic cases. We have noticed in our own uh, mobility data that individuals are spending more time, not just outside of their home, but further away from their home uh, since the spring when individuals were uh, obviously staying close to home, uh, both for uh, complying with the stay home, stay safe order, uh, but also generally staying closer in their community uh, due to fear of traveling uh, outside uh, of a close circle. So certainly uh, with increased mobility, you're seeing cases that do pop up easily being spread through other geographic areas. Then a few days later, the first few cases at St. Michael's College were identified up in the Burlington area. Initially, there were eight individual cases detected through campus surveillance testing. So this is the testing that the colleges are doing on a routine basis, uh, week after week, in addition to their uh, restart testing that they did when everyone came back to campus. Uh, the contact uh, tracing conducted a COVID uh, positive individuals go into quarantine, those eight that were identified. Um, and then the first reported case of transmission among the college was just a few days later on October 21st, um, leading to uh, an additional uh, 18 or so students identified and bringing that total today uh, to 30, uh, 30 cases as of Actually, that's as of October 18th, and you'll see that just six cases were added last night. So this was an outbreak that sparked from, you know, that outbreak in central Vermont and then sparked its own larger outbreak uh, at uh, St. Michael's College, uh, not just in the immediate days following the outbreak, but in the few preceding weeks as well, and seeing the impact even recently with seven cases or six cases as of yesterday. You can look at what the impact of the outbreak has been uh, on Vermont since October 7th. You'll notice from the slide that shows all of our cases reported since that date that the outbreak in central Vermont has accounted for 26.5 of all of the cases that we've reported over these last two weeks. I think that's important for Vermonters to keep in mind for two reasons. One, again, that such a, a small you know, event can spark so many cases. But then also in terms of the increased case counts that we've seen in recent weeks, Many of them are attributable to this specific outbreak. And if you look at the other uh, cases that are associated with an outbreak as well, uh, an even broader uh, variety of cases associated with outbreaks. You'll also see from the geographic distribution again that this is not something that was localized to a particular geographic area like we experienced with the Winooski outbreak, but spread quickly to other communities throughout the state and even within smaller communities in certain particular locations as well. 
Now we have some areas of takeaway and areas of concern, but these are areas that I'm going to let Dr. Kelso uh, talk about since she's going to have more insights in terms of uh, behaviors that may have led to this outbreak and also observations about what we can do to uh, prevent similar outbreaks in the future. Dr. Kelso. Thanks, Commissioner Pichek. I think the most important takeaway from this is that we all have a role to play in preventing the spread of COVID-19. As, as you've just seen in Dr. Pichek's presentation, just one case can quickly spread um, to multiple communities, multiple schools and work sites and colleges and other settings. Um, and the more cases we have, the more at risk we are for seeing hospitalizations and perhaps deaths that result from those initial cases. So um, the things that the epi teams realized as they investigated this outbreak and as it spread was that um, people were gathering um, in group sizes that met the ACCD requirements and guidelines, but yet there were gatherings indoors and outdoors, and at times people were not wearing masks. Um, you know, we've all been saying for months, um, mask up, uh, masks help prevent the spread. It's really, really important to do that. We've also seen that um, people were not always um, strictly following quarantine, and that's whether um, they had been identified as a close contact and were not, um, you know, staying away from others. Uh, after travel, again, not observing the quarantine requirements. And then even some people with COVID-19 like symptoms, not diagnosed with COVID-19, but had symptoms that could have been COVID-19, uh, not staying away from others. So uh, these things are what all of us need to do all the time to get a check on the spread of this virus. We also saw that um, some people who had symptoms and thought they might have COVID and sought a COVID test continued to do um, daily routine activities in their communities. And finally, um, the health screenings that workplaces and venues are all implementing are really important. We know that not everybody with COVID-19 has symptoms, but if you do have symptoms that could be due to COVID-19, it's important to pay attention to those yourselves um, so that you can be monitoring your own health and, and know when things might be um, taking a turn. But also um, report if you have symptoms. Um, don't go to venues or events if you have symptoms. These are things that are gonna prevent the spread. And my last message is that um, cases of COVID-19 often begin with no symptoms and someone may feel fine and yet they may have been exposed um, through no fault of their own, but they may have been exposed and be incubating the virus and becoming pre-symptomatic and be infectious to other people. So be aware, all of the recommendations about wearing masks and staying six feet apart and not gathering unless you need to and being outdoors as, as much as possible, all those things are important because you can spread COVID-19 before you have any symptoms. And what we've seen in this outbreak and in, in other situations time and time again is that um, people think they're fine and they may go out to eat or go to an event and then find out a number of days later that they were in fact infectious at the time. And I think I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. Abundant lessons that we should all be instructed by. In Vermont, we've been proud of our work to keep COVID-19 from spreading for many months now. We stayed outside, kept our distance, wore masks, and our data showed that what we did worked, even when other places struggled. And while we should be proud, we may have gotten a little too comfortable with our relative success thinking Vermont is different than other places. But Vermont is not safe from COVID-19. Nowhere is. Because now we're seeing what happens when we let our guard down even just a little bit here in Vermont. 
multiple outbreaks that are growing, and cases showing up in an increasing number of child care programs and schools. But we continue to do very well when you look at the large numbers of schools we have, the large numbers of child cares we have, and the small numbers that have been affected. Nonetheless, over the last several weeks, we've been following a total of 11 situations in schools, many of them just in a monitoring phase at this point in time, and three in child cares. The majority of these involve very small numbers and have had very straightforward recommendations and dispositions. But I again stress, because this is always an important take home point, any case represents a significant disruption. Disruption to the smooth operation of a class, the smooth operation of a school, parents' concerns about child care needs uh, because children may have to have come home uh, while their classes are in a pause situation, etc. Now our contact tracing teams are working hard and successfully responding to many situations around the state to contain outbreaks and keep the virus from spreading. But we all need to do our part. I know we are tired of this pandemic. There's a lot of uncertainty right now, and I know how hard that is too. But the virus is making a dangerous comeback in many parts of the country. Leaders in other states are issuing dire warnings and taking drastic measures again. The bottom line is this is the worst time to let COVID fatigue set in. Last night, I spoke with my state health official colleagues from Maine, Rhode Island, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, and all shared the same concerns. And unfortunately, some shared the same rising percent positivity rates which in the case of New Jersey are now over 6%, here in the Northeast. And we discussed the various types of guidance we provide to our respective populations, the kinds of restrictions that people and their states have had to live under, and the successes we've had in managing the pandemic thus far. Several of my colleagues were actively discussing implementing dramatic changes for the immediate future with their governors. One thing all of us agreed on, though, we should do everything possible to keep our schools and child cares open for in-person education and care as a priority. So let's focus on what we can control. We can consider all the things we do every day carefully. We can keep our social circles small. Limiting those close contacts, we have limits potential spread of the virus and make sure others we interact with agree on what the ground rules are for our interactions with them. We can also forego travel. That's a really hard holiday message to deliver. But since we're surrounded by mainly red and yellow counties, it may just not be worth the risk. But if Vermonters do leave the state, make sure to follow our quarantine rules. And if visitors come into your home for the holidays from most places in the region, or your college student returns from the fall semester from a faraway state, they too must quarantine. And we can choose activities with the lowest risk possible. I'll repeat the simple guide again. Keep six foot spaces, masks on faces, and avoid crowded places. The more of, the th of these things you can do, the less risky it will be. And the less risk we take on, the more we can protect classmates, coworkers, and our own families. And obviously keep this in mind as you celebrate Halloween this weekend. And remember, thus far, we have only one example with one school that has had in-class transmission. But every school reflects what the burden of cases is in their community, in the communities that families, staff, and teachers may have traveled to. Keeping our community safe with low growth rate of cases will keep our schools healthy and open. We are seeing cases go up here in Vermont, but there's still time to double down on our prevention efforts 
and we can still be proud of what we've done and what we still have left to do. For my closing comments, I wanted to talk about one other topic. I very frequently hear, and when I watch TV, and I don't hear just, just from Vermonters, I see this on TV, so few Vermonters have died. So few have been hospitalized. What are we worrying about? This is a benign disease. But we know better. And let me detail the ways we know better. First of all, I am watching hospitalizations start to pick up, very slowly, but real. And we know this is an indicator that lags several weeks behind the increase in cases. Currently, we have, to our knowledge, six individuals in the hospital, with several of those in an ICU. That is admittedly still a very small number, and we would hope it will stay that way. But that is an indicator that we are now following very closely. Over the course of the pandemic, death rates have improved nationwide, even if hospitalization rates are worsening across the country. There's no evidence that this is because the virus itself has changed or is less virulent at this time. In Vermont, it's become really evident that we've gotten really good at protecting the most vulnerable, whether they live independently at home, in long-term care facilities, or in correctional facilities, or in our colleges even, which are really self-contained entities, if you will. Another point is that the latest surges around the country have been among people whose average age is somewhat younger than earlier on in the pandemic. But we know that over time, even though the initial cases are younger, these evolve into cases involving more middle-aged and then older populations. A recent study in New York City at Langone Medical Center showed that even when you um, control for age and other diseases that a person may have, the improvements we've seen in death rates are real. So why is this? It may be because we actually have had significant research in therapies as the pandemic has worn on. We know for a fact that dexamethasone, a potent steroid, can save lives for the very sickest hospitalized patients. We know that remdesivir, an antiviral drug, even though it does not have a survival advantage, can shorten the duration and lessen the severity of a person's illness. And we've become so much better with ICU management, ventilator management, oxygen management. And we've learned how to deal with newly identified complications like blood clots in a more effective and timely manner. And finally, just listen to the stories of some of those who you may know who may have been ill or have developed long-term chronic symptoms. We now believe these so-called long haulers may account for up to 10% of those who have been ill. We need to learn so much more about these people, and research is ongoing. But the current literature would impress upon us that contracting COVID is not a pleasant experience and may have more long-term after effects. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. <clears throat> we'll now open it up to questions. Okay, we're going to start the room with Calvin. Just want to remind folks that we have 26 people in the queue and an hour and a half to get through it all. Calvin? Uh, thank you. So first question, probably just a uh, question for Dr. Levine. So you kind of just touched upon it, but this week, the state is now differentiating between hospitalization data and also people that are in the ICU. Uh, I'm wondering, I guess, why that change was made and sort of what, what the reasoning behind it is in putting it on the state's dashboard. The only difference is it's now being portrayed on the dashboard. We've actually been discussing it at our press conferences frequently. Um, so it's just in the interest of greater transparency on the dashboard. And it's not because all of a sudden we are so alarmed and feel that those numbers are going to skyrocket. And then, uh, Governor, um, 
that you probably saw uh, Justice Kavanaugh, he had to issue a uh, slight correction to one of his rulings earlier this week after Secretary Condos expressed some concern. Um, I'm just wondering, I guess, what, what your take is on how we changed our election process and how that's playing out sort of on the national stage and in this case, Wisconsin, how that's affecting uh, how they conduct their elections too. Yeah, again, I, I haven't been following it as closely as maybe you have and others, uh, but uh, uh, thus far, uh, we've seen uh, robust, uh, I guess, uh, voting uh, by, by these ballots that were sent to everyone. Um, we can be proud of that. Uh, over 200,000 people have voted uh, thus far, over 200,000. And uh, we could be heading towards a record year. So, you know, we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to vote. I'd like to see it exceed. I'd like to see us break the record. And there's no reason we shouldn't because uh, there's no excuses. Everyone has a ballot and, uh, and should be able to, uh, to take this opportunity uh, to exercise that, that right to vote and, and express their feelings as well. I uh, was wondering if within the bounds of uh, privacy concerns, uh, it's possible to um, say any more about the connection between the Central Command outbreak and the St. Mike's outbreak. Was that specifically connected to the sports leagues? Dr. Kelso. Yes, we have linked the, the larger ice sports outbreak to the outbreak at St. Michael's College. Um, are you able to say if it was players or coaches that, that brought that up? I am not. Okay. Um, and um, are, is the administration able to say, or public safety, whether now switching topics to the cyber attacks um, against UVM Medical Center and the network, has a demand been made or has a ransom been requested in order to restore the system? Uh, I am not aware of any uh, demands at this point in time, but I'm going to refer to nothing, yeah, nothing that we're aware of at this point, Got nothing it. that we've heard about. Um, and a bigger question, I guess, for public health, perhaps. Um, if looking at the balance between centralizing records in an electronic form, there's a benefit and a risk. The benefit is convenience and lots of others to name. The risk is apparent now with the vulnerability. Um, is there a situation in which uh, centralizing electronic records would ever be reconsidered in order to mitigate the risk, um, or do the benefit outweigh the risk? You want to take this one in regards to vital and yeah. okay, Secretary Smith. That's a hard question to answer, um, and. Uh, Thank you for it, I think. Um, the, you know, we've come a long way in technology in trying to enhance our advantage in, in medicine and healthcare in particular. Um, you know, this was a, a, a cyber attack on a network, so it was contained within a network um, and not sort of wider spread. So in that regard, it isn't sort of a, a centralized uh, attack. It, it is contained. I, you know, we we as a society have to weigh, you know, the efforts that technology brings with the risks that technology brings, and and this exposes some of the risks. But at the same time, we can't forget some of the things that it does. It speeds up our healthcare system. It makes a better decisions within our healthcare system. So I think it's a balance to answer your question. I, I don't think we'll we'll be decentralizing back to the old days when we were, all had paper files in our specific location. But at the same time, we do have to be vigilant in in thwarting these these kind of attacks. Thank you. Uh, yes, given the uh, change in temperature this morning, um, I'm just wondering, uh, as, as we go forward and people start to retreat into their homes uh, and into restaurants or, or wherever, um, are we rethinking how we um, enforce, perhaps, the, uh, the restrictions on, uh, on restaurants and, and, and other public places? Uh, going forward for the for the winter 
season? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let Dr. Levine uh, follow up on this, but uh, again, from my perspective, uh, the guidelines are pretty simple. And if we follow the guidelines we have in place right now, uh, we should uh, mitigate the problems that may follow. And, um, and I, I know it's going to be a little more problematic because we're, we just tend to gather more inside. We tend to have more groups uh, with us, uh, maybe groups that have, um, we don't know where they've been or where they travel to. Uh, so that's why it's really important, uh, everything that we talked about earlier, to adhere to. You know, just, just be very wary of, uh, of those you associate yourselves with and uh, maybe ask some questions about did they, did they travel in the last uh, few days? Uh, um, are they wearing masks, for instance? Uh, just know, uh, you know, just be more aware of the environment you're in. And, and if we do, and we mask up, and we do all the things we ask you to do, we should be fine. Um, but, uh, but again, I think it's it really, I, I say this a lot, but it's literally in our hands. You know, we, each and every one of us, uh, has a role to play in this. And if we, if we play the role well, uh, we'll get through this, and we have thus far, so we can do it again. No, not, not a lot to add to that, but I will remind you, Steve, that though it was 32-ish degrees this morning, this didn't begin today. It's been going on and off for weeks, and people's retreat to the indoors began weeks ago, and I think that is reflected in some of the increase in cases we've seen. And that's what we forecast. Uh, aside from the modeling data, uh, we forecast we would see more cases. The question would be the magnitude of that increase. And hopefully it will stay modest where it is at this point in time. Um, so there's self-enforcement when you're in settings that are not commercial establishments, but you're uh, just dealing with your daily life in your own home and other people's homes uh, and where you gather with other people. And then there's, I think, what you're alluding to, which is more enforcement in maybe a commercial setting or things of that sort, um, where there are plenty, plenty of education, plenty of guidelines, and opportunities for um, us to understand when things are going well and not going well there without necessarily any special uh, enforcement rules or things of that sort. Well, in your contact tracing of some of these other uh, breakouts, it's, it's, I'm, I assume it's very helpful for whatever place, whether it's a personal home or an establishment, uh, that they have the names of the people that, you know, that uh, they're serving or, or whichever. Uh, some places are doing that, some places are not. Uh, I would imagine that that's something that you really would stress to. And we do stress that, and when we're informed about uh, the lack of adherence to that, we, we do investigate that further. But the, the major point being, though, on, on your comments is that um, we have not, from an epidemiologic standpoint, found abundant cases in the lodging industry, in the restaurant industry, even associated with bars, uh, where other states have sometimes found uh, some of these associations. So certainly our uh, Opportunities for that to happen may be abundant, but we're not seeing that as a frequently reported kind of issue. Thank you. Yeah. If, I, if I could just add one more thing, Steve. Uh, if you, everyone could just make sure, if you're contacted by a contact tracer, just be forthright. Give them the information they're asking for, and uh, we'll mitigate a lot of, uh, of what we've seen. Uh, because if they're not forthright, if we have to go back to them, you know, two or three times uh, before we get the correct information, it just that lag is when the uh, the virus will spread and it'll spread quickly. So that's when it gets out of hand. Okay, we're going to move the phones now. Joseph from the Bar and Chronicle. Um, I think this is for Secretary French. Um, one of my readers, who is um, a, a music teacher, is concerned or perhaps confused about the rules for teaching instrumental music 
he said, um, you know, the new guidelines allow for an individual student to sing or play a wind instrument in a well-ventilated room. So teachers can teach one student at a time by yelling through the door? That's a question. Um, he said, at the moment, the only option is to teach outside. Um, and he notes that will be possible soon. Um, is this just the reality he's going to live with? Or are there any, ever other thoughts in the matter? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, music's been a very challenging area for us to develop guidance in because we have the pretty compelling science, uh, you know, based on studies that were done with chorus groups around the world uh, that speak to the dangers, particularly indoors, of music activities. So the best we could do uh, in our most recent revision was to provide some accommodation for individual practice, essentially. It's not uh, to your reader's question so much anticipating uh, a teacher working through a door uh, to teach, per se, but it does provide a provision for individuals to practice. Uh, but we're really, you know, it's going to require additional time uh, before we're able to uh, provide some uh, advice and guidance on mitigation strategies for music. Okay, thank you very much. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. My question was kind of answered in the opening remarks about gatherings for the holiday season. And I'm just wondering how people should treat hunting camp when they start to arrive in a couple of weeks and if there's any concern that there might be an uptick because of all the uh, people gathering for holiday season, the holiday season, even if they go against your recommendations. Yeah, Chris, you know, we have discussed that uh, a bit. And my advice would be for anyone going to deer camp, uh, use that as your quarantine. Go to deer camp, stay there. Uh, don't, don't go out, I mean, other than going out to hunt. And uh, you'll be fine. Uh, but just, again, know who you're who you're with there in the camp, uh, make sure uh, you know where they travel from, and, uh, and then just make sure you're safe within the camp. Uh, I mean, it's the same guidelines as anything else that we've uh, proposed, but, but again, I would advocate um, just, just, you know, go to camp and uh, do whatever you normally do, but, but just enjoy the outdoors and, uh, and enjoy the camp, uh, camp atmosphere, but, uh, but don't go out other than that. Okay, and again, is there a concern that it might be an uptick even if people don't uh, go by your recommendations? Well, it's always a concern, um, and uh, and it's something again we've we've spoken about, but uh, but it's up to again individuals, all of us uh, individually, uh, to make sure that we prevent the spread of the virus, and uh, that includes deer camp. Okay, great, thank you, Mike Donahue. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering uh, why the uh, delay in the winter high school sports rules. Uh, high schools and athletes have been waiting a long time and were promised answers by the end of the month, and now it will be November before you. Have yeah, the rules it, out. You know, we'll we'll have them uh, next week, Mike. But uh, but I'll take some of the blame for that. I mean, I'm I'm cautious by nature, and when I see uh, the amount of red. Uh, throughout the region uh, coming into the state to see the rise in positive positivity or rates here in our own state. Uh, I just thought it was important uh, to make sure that we knew what we were doing before moving forward. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, you know, we've seen um, maybe some, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, good news this week. Uh, we got to a high point uh, last weekend, it seemed like, and then uh, started to drop off this week. So. I'm feeling uh, better about the uh, the number of cases, and I hope it uh, it persists and, and continues. Uh, but we'll uh, it'll be early uh, in the week that you'll see that guidance. Okay. And the other thing is, St. Michael's uh, College was identified as the one school involved in this outbreak, and just wondering uh, what other schools in the specific towns where we can find those lists that have been impacted by this outbreak. Dr. Kelso. Yeah, there there is one um, K through 12 school, um, St. Mike's, one business, two businesses. Those are the four um, sub outbreaks to the St. Mike's outbreak. We're not going to reveal the the names of those um, 
schools or establishments to protect confidentiality. Uh, under what provision are you the confidentiality? It's not HIPAA. We've already cleared that up that HIPAA doesn't pertain to this. Yeah, I think, you know, we have seen um, over the course of this pandemic, like we've seen with other infectious diseases, um, when people are outed or um, institutions are outed, there are often negative repercussions on individuals. Um, we've seen death threats. We've seen services be stopped for individuals and communities. Um, and unless there's a, a you know, a real strong underlying reason why the public needs to know something to protect themselves, um, we're just not going to reveal information that might put people at risk. But if somebody has a child in that school K-12 or somebody is in that business, don't they have yeah, I, un and all that. I understand there's me, there's concern. I don't think we're keeping Vermonters in the dark. Um, when there is a risk to an individual at a school or a business, for example, uh, the contact tracing team has done the work to identify just what that risk is and to whom. And we notify those people. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody else in Vermont needs to know. So there, when there are potential risks, we do notify people directly. I guess I still don't understand why you would want the people to know if their kid is going to a K-12 school, that that school may have been impacted. Yeah, and again, um, the reason we don't broadly, <laughs> broadly notify is because there's not a risk to everybody. Mike, this is uh, Mike Smith. Just let me just add quickly. We do name the schools um, if we have a case. So the out there, that we, we don't name whether it's a student or a, a faculty member of that school, but we do name the schools um, when, we, when we report out. I'll, I'll move so on. Union Memorial, they asked me, is it Union Memorial? Yes, we did name that. Okay. Okay, that's all is that. I just wanted to make sure that that was still linked into that hockey. They, yeah, they actually, they actually named themselves, uh, Mike, um, initially. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that the numbers match up. And who are the two businesses? That I'm not aware of, and I'm not sure that, I, I just don't know. But you'll be briefed on that by next Tuesday. Yeah, I mean we can we can get you if if it is public we can we can give you the information. Yeah, I mean I know that they said they were going to get back to us about the uh, HIPAA thing and they never did. Uh, um, so I assume that was just proven. But thanks, I appreciate it. Okay. Well. BT Digger. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great, uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, my first question is just can I get uh, the most up to date number that the health department has right now for total? Confirmed cases connected to K to 12 Yeah, yeah. I don't think they've changed uh, any Lola since Tuesday. I think Tuesday we do it once a week, and that is the up to date number. It doesn't change since Tuesday. Right. So there have been no reports, or you just haven't been no, able we, to? I think we update it every single week. We update it on once a week, correct? Yeah. Once a week, we, we update that and give you the official number. Right. right. No, I know that's when the dashboard is updated, which is why I'm asking that. I'm just wondering if there's a new kind of interim number that you would be willing to share. Um, 
which I, I guess is uh, not the case. Um, I, I do kind of want to follow up on what um, Mike was asking about, though. I'm mostly confused because um, the health officials, I think as early as last week, were saying that the cases at Union Elementary in Montpelier had been linked to um, the hockey outbreak. And so, I mean, just in terms of kind of assessing the impact of the outbreak and understanding to which schools it has spread, I, I'm, I'm a little confused as to the logic as to why we wouldn't say which schools, given that we are saying when there are cases in specific schools. Yeah, I think we came up with a standard early on about the number of students and faculty, uh, and if they were over that number, we would uh, we would issue the name of the school, but if it was under, we would not uh, issue that name. Right. That I'm may be where the confusion is. You, yeah, this this particular case, Union came out, I think, before we named uh, Union Elementary. No, that's, that's not true, guys. I, I asked the health department whether or not they were saying that First, you said they weren't, and then I followed up a few days later, and it seemed like you guys had received more information um, at that point through contact tracing and said, no, actually, we do believe they are linked. Um, so, th and that was before the school, as far as I know, said anything publicly. Um, in fact, at, at that point, they were still saying they understood that there was no link. Yeah, I, I can't, I guess I can't debate you on that, uh, Lola, because I think the contact tracers, as soon as they made the link, made the link. But but I do remember, or in the initially didn't think there was a link to the school, uh, but the school was okay. named at that point, I believe. So I, I don't know. I don't know the date. You you write the stories. You probably have all that information. So we can we can get back to you on that if that's a a sticking point. Right. What is it you'd like and, to and know, I, though, Lola? I'm, I'm, well, I. I, I would I would like to know which K to twelve schools, you know, their cases have been linked. Which schools have had their cases linked back to the hockey outbreak? I think it's Union. Union Elementary. Only, only Union Elementary. As far as I know, is that correct? Yes. Everyone's shaking their head. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. And then uh, a quick other question, and then I'll let you guys right. go. Um, has there been any other thought, I know there were a bunch of questions last week about, uh, you know, updated guidance for schools regarding the holidays and holiday travel? Yeah, we'll be issuing that next week as well. Okay. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lola. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, uh, Governor, you're... Uh, executive order on ice rink directing them to freeze their schedule that uh, lapses at midnight tonight. Is that expected to lapse or is there any further action you're going to take? I, I don't believe we'll be taking any further action specifically on uh, freezing the uh, the reservation at this point. No, I, I think we'll we'll just let that go. And it said in, in when you had made that decision and I asked it before and it wasn't, I don't know if the data has come back or not yet. That there had been a suggestion that the outbreak in Central Vermont was connected to hockey in New Hampshire. Has there been any more clarity on that? There is no certainty. Yeah, apparently, apparently nothing. Um, we couldn't make a direct link back, but there was suspicion of uh, of maybe that connection, but that we did, weren't able to make any direct link. So, does do state officials still believe that there is? Some kind of link to New Hampshire? Um, at this point, um, I don't know as it matters um, because it's been so long. But again, we, we want everyone uh, to be careful in where they're traveling to and from and with the number of cases we're seeing in New Hampshire, uh, that would be even more relevant today. Okay, thank you. Joe Lee, Local 22, Local 44. Can you hear me okay? We can. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to know um, what goes into characterizing the outbreak as contained or not contained? And do we know if the central Vermont um, ice um, outbreak is 
still not contained? I'll leave it to Dr. Kelso or Dr. Levine. Thanks for that question. We use a standardized criteria for how we define when something is an outbreak. Um, and similarly, there are guidelines and criteria for when you declare an outbreak closed or resolved. Um, typically, it's when two incubation periods have passed with no additional cases. And given that, um, you know, the, the timeline for when we expect an outbreak might be closed out, um, that can shift and that timeline can get extended as more cases are identified because then uh, we have to track the contacts of each new case. Um, so it's something we take a look at. We're not considering the sports, uh, ice sports outbreak contained or closed at this time. Thank you. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Stuart? Star six on you. Okay, we're gonna move to CAT, WCAX. Hi, this question is for Dr. Levine. Are these COVID long haulers, are these people who continue to test positive for the virus after a period of weeks or months, or are these people who have ongoing symptoms or complications from having had the virus? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I'm gonna answer it to the best of my ability. Again, repeating that there's research going on about this as we speak. However, these are not usually people who are positive testers down the road. They just complain of symptoms that won't go away and uh, behave like someone who has what we would call a post-viral syndrome that may involve significant fatigue or a variety of other symptoms, uh, but they don't, they're not required. They're, actually, there is no case definition for long hauler. Uh, uh, it's not even a medical term at this point, but there's certainly no requirement that you continue to test positive um, it's just that you had a defined illness for which you did have a positive test and now you cannot rid yourself of these more enduring symptoms. Any idea of how many of these will call, continue even though it's not a medical term, but call it long haulers we have in Vermont? No, uh, we're not really aware to be honest. Um, you know, and, and nationwide, the, the low ball estimate is 1%, the high ball estimate is 10%, uh, but unclear if the truth lies in between or even beyond those numbers, it's hard to know. But we don't really have a good handle on it in Vermont uh, with our, I guess we're in the 2100 case range at this point in time uh, for total cases that we've confirmed. That is an area ripe for study that we'll actually be talking about internally, but uh, we don't actually have any data on them yet. And I know at one point the state had been tracking a couple of cases where there was a uh, person who continued to test positive after a period of weeks or months. So uh, do you keep track of those still, or is that just a couple of cases and they're not common? Yeah, those are... Uh, they're not common, but we do see them. Uh, and we've seen them in the general population. We've seen them in the population in nursing homes and other skilled nursing facilities. Um, often those individuals, even though they have a positive test, don't have any symptoms. Um, and they just retain their test positivity. Some of them do have some ongoing symptoms and retain their test positivity as well. So. They're a different population, we think, than the long haul population. Got it. I, if you indulge me, one more question that's a yes or a no answer. Will a contact tracer leave a voicemail if you don't pick up? Yes, we found out that that is true. Uh, they may not leave it on the first call, uh, but they'll at least indicate they're calling from the state. You know, that it's not like they'll leave it a, a extensive uh, phone message. 
but letting somebody know okay, that, they're, you know. that they're from the state so they don't mistake the phone number as a uh, another type of call. Call in Flanders, seven days. Colin? Hi, sorry. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, this question is for you, Governor. Um, I am curious as to whether, um, well, first of all, have you heard about the situation in West Paulette that was reported by BC Digger yesterday, the um, militia training site? Y yes, I've been, I've been aware of the situation for, for a while, yes. Oh, um, I'm curious as to why the state has not taken more action to address the concerns of some of the neighbors there. Um, I was hoping you could fill us in on um, the, the efforts to date and why more has been done. Uh, again, I think I'm going to let our Commissioner of Public Safety answer that. Uh, I have been briefed on it on an ongoing basis, and uh, but he might be able to provide a bit more information. Good afternoon. Uh, this has been on uh, the radar for the Department of Public Safety and the State Police since before I arrived at Public Safety in late 2019. We've received multiple reports of uh, various activities at that site, ranging from noise to threats to potential zoning violations. Um, some of those fact patterns have been investigated and reported up to prosecutors to ensure that uh, our assessment that Nothing has risen to the level of criminal charges has been uh, uh, has occurred at this stage. We are very sensitive to the concerns of neighbors and folks in that area, uh, and we remain vigilant and responsive to all incoming reports uh, about activity there. We take all reports of threats and harassment very seriously. Um, we have folks assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force here in Vermont and. We scan the landscape not only for uh, threats and, and issues um, specific to uh, things that we receive directly like uh, reports at this facility, but, um, but also on a, a, a statewide and a, a national landscape. Um, we have briefed, uh, we've been in contact with local and state officials from that area. We've briefed legislators on our uh, overall uh, threat mitigation posture, how investigations work, what kinds of things we can investigate. Um, those briefings have occurred twice, once in August and once uh, yesterday. And um, that's the general overview. I'm not sure if I actually hit the, the nugget of your question, though. Um, well, I guess one other thing I'll ask you, and then, but I would like the governor's way in if possible on this question. But um, Commissioner Sherling, can you say, are you aware of any federal investigations going on right now um, involving Slate Ridge? I can't uh, discuss any potential federal investigations because it's outside my purview, but uh, I can say we have shared information um, with federal authorities, and I have every confidence that if uh, they uncovered something that rose to the level of a federal criminal charge, that uh, they would take that very seriously. And then just, uh, Governor, I understand why you would uh, have the commissioner speak to this, but I would like to ask you specifically, do you think, um, uh, why, why hasn't the state done more in your opinion? Um, why, why are these concerns um, continually be, being brought up by these neighbors? I mean, some of them are in real fear here. I'm just curious as to why the state hasn't done more. Well, again, I think the commissioner explained everything that we are doing, and that's not doing nothing. Um, we're very much aware of the situation. We're monitoring the situation. Um, but if it doesn't rise to the, the uh, level of a criminal offense, uh, what would you suppose we should do? Well, I guess I would just turn that around. I mean, what do you say to these neighbors that say that we, they're we've been, we've been, fears? Yeah, again, we've been uh, addressing uh, their concerns. We've been uh, reacting uh, when they've been calling. Uh, we've been in contact with them. Uh, we've been in contact with legislators on two separate occasions. Uh, it's not as though we're just letting this go. Uh, but there's some things we can say, some things we can't, and we're continuing to monitor the situation. And what can you say? Sorry, last question. I, I, what can I, well, I, if I could say it, I would, right? So 
uh, we'll have to just leave it at that. All right, thank you. Aaron, DT Digger. Aaron Patenko, BT Digger. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, first off, I, I, I do just want to point out that state's own presentation uh, from last Tuesday specifically cites six schools that were potentially exposed to COVID as part of the hockey outbreak. So it definitely seems like that outbreak spread past UD Elementary. And I'm, I'm referring to Libby's presentation on Tuesday. Um, but uh, my, my question well, is... Well, maybe, maybe, uh, probably also <laughs> maybe you could report that to Lola then, because you're in the same, you're in the same entity, right? Yes. Well, okay. I think that, you know, her, her point is that, the, that officials have said different things at different times. And, you know, here we're hearing, oh, today we're hearing, oh, it's only in elementary, but it, it's been varying reports at varying times. Um, and we're just, we're just trying to, to figure out what the answer is. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, my, my question is probably also for Dr. Levine. I um, I want to know if you consider Vermont to be on the verge of a second wave. And I know that the definition of a second wave can really vary depending on who you ask, and it's sometimes considered to be a bit of a misnomer, but. It definitely, you know, when you look at the chart for Vermont, it definitely looks like we are, we had this big peak in April and then long period of low case levels and then it's starting to, starting to look like the peak in April again. And, you know, does that mean that we could be uh, approaching a second wave if we don't, if we keep on the track that we're on and, um, is there a point at which you would you would say this is the second wave? Thanks. Let me let me try to address that for you, because um, I, I think all the talks of waves um, confuses everybody in in the whole country, um, and I'd, I'd rather look at it as where did a particular place in the country get the virus level suppressed to? And then did they get a wave after that or a spike in their cases? So if you look at our data, most of it tracks um, the larger outbreaks we've had in the state. And so, you know, we had the Burlington Winooski outbreak that was substantial, but as you saw, we came down from that. We had other smaller spikes at the time we had other uh, outbreaks, uh, including the one at Champlain Orchard. We now have another spike that clearly at its inception was related to the central Vermont issues that we've talked about here at the conference today. And we don't actually know how that's fully playing out yet in terms of uh, when, you know, Dr. Kelso mentioned two incubation periods. That's a long time for us to wait, but generally we will find that when we look at the slope of the epi curve, we can predict that we're uh, coming down and uh, the cases are becoming further apart in time and smaller in number. So uh, I, I don't want to use the word second wave at this point, but I do want to use the word a resurgence of virus that's not only in our data, but that is in the entire region's data and in at least 42 plus states data. Um, and it's all related, I think, to the more of the transitions back indoors and the fact that uh, the seasons have changed, schools have opened, uh, tourism, all kinds of factors uh, related to the leaves and what have you. Um, and that explains why there's a resurgence. The, the, real, the real question that I'd like to reframe your question as is, will this be a uh, prolonged and ongoing and increasing resurgence, or will we be able to determine that things have actually quieted down and, and come down substantially? And with regard to your first question, there have actually been other schools impacted by the hockey outbreak, the Central Vermont outbreak. The one at Union 
is a true outbreak. Others are cases. And uh, there's a big difference between that. And it's you know, not unusual for us to say that we have a number of schools that have had cases. And literally, that may mean one person in the school at some level, whether it be student or an adult. Um, and so those are situations that we certainly uh, don't need to be labeling case by case for uh, as we investigate schools across the state. It's very different than when you have a school that had such a large impact uh, like the Union School that we were talking about previously. So I hope that clarifies things. So on my slide last week, when we said this number of schools, this number of workplaces, that data is accurate. Um, but it doesn't mean that those are each outbreaks. St. Mike's, clearly an outbreak. Many of those others, most of those others, not what we would classify as an outbreak, just as another uh, end result of the original outbreak. Okay, uh, Dr. Wilson, well, thank you so much for clarifying. Um, I, I, you know, I, we've been getting a lot of emails from parents going, well, the Department of Health website was three, the school said seven, but the press conference they said six. And, you know, we, we know that they care and it matters to them. So we're, we're just trying to see like, why is there such a, a difference um, sometimes from time to time, sometimes depending on what data source you look at, and sometimes depending on what the exact definition is of the case. So, yeah, no, that's, and that's I. Part of why you yeah, keep getting these questions. Yeah, no, I empathize and I completely understand. Um, but keep in mind, every parent knows because their school has told them when a situation has arisen in their school, and that's the most important communication of all. And whether the school communicates, as they probably would not, that you know this this one case we have in our school is a result of the Central Vermont issues or whether it's because somebody traveled to Europe and came home, that doesn't really matter in the end. Uh, the parents need to know what's going on in their school, what have public health and the school together come to as conclusions about what recommendations need to be made and what actions taken. Um, and it's less about uh, was this another manifestation of the hockey outbreak or was it something totally unrelated? And rest assured, all parents should be comforted by the fact that their schools are immediately uh, informing their entire community when something has arisen in those settings. They've been very transparent. We've been side by side with them, working with them and making recommendations. And um, I think that's really uh, a smoothly functioning process. And it's still a success story in terms of looking at a reopening of the educational sector and even reopening schools that have decided to have classes go remote for a period of time or what have you. Thank you. Thanks. Guide page. Governor, the state of Vermont has at least three consumer portals. The Secretary of State's My Voter page, DMV, My DMV, DOL, Unemployment Claimant Portal, uh, with the problems at UVMMC's patient portal, have you asked your IT people to evaluate possible exposure to hackers via these relatively low security consumer portals? Um, you know, probably a better question for our agency, to Digital Services. I know they do a tremendous job and I'm very thankful we developed the agency in uh, my first year in office because uh, they've been instrumental in all of the things that we're talking about today as we uh, migrate towards more information um, by electronic measures. Um, so w I'm sure our, our agency of digital services is looking at every opportunity um, to provide for the security for our IT system, both in our state government, uh, but for also for others as well, and to make sure that we protect that. Um, so I, I don't know exactly uh, the answer to your question, but I'd be happy to have our, our um, uh, Secretary Quinn uh, get in touch with you uh, to try and answer that for you. That'd be terrific. Um, uh, also, I understand 
Uh, you, you're definitely pleading to Vermonters to be more careful with, with COVID stuff. That's, that's loud and clear. Uh, you said in your fair statement, uh, if we want to keep our economy and schools open, and Commissioner Levine said his colleagues are looking at dramatic changes. So are you saying that limiting in-person access to businesses, uh, you know, going, going more back towards the spring, is that back on the table? And no. so what would that look like? I, I would just say everything is still always on the table, depending on what we were facing. Um, so we will do what we can to protect Vermonters uh, in any way possible. We've been doing it, limiting the, uh, the amount of travel in and out of the state uh, for throughout the, the pandemic, and we've learned a lot. Uh, we don't want to move backwards. That's my point. Um, and, and if we follow the guidance individually, follow the guidance that, that we put into place, we won't have to move backwards. We can continue to move forward. Um, so it's just, again, just to be aware of of the situation we find ourselves in. So if we if we see an uptick uh, where people are not following the guidance and not adhering to uh, any of the regulations we put into place, um, we'll be forced to do something about it. And, and I'm not sure what that will be yet, uh, but it depends on the situation. So uh, again, everything's always on the table, but, uh, but it is nothing uh, that we're talking about at this point in time uh, in moving backwards. It's just, again, trying to make sure that we stay vigilant. Thank you. Lisa, Waterbury, read it out. Good morning. Um, I think I would like to go back to the original uh, presentation, looking at the slides. Um, With uh, Commissioner Pichak? Yeah, yeah, Commissioner Pichak and the, the hockey explanation that he went through. Okay. On the slide that shows the, let's see, the outbreak summary. I'm looking at the dots, and I want to make sure I'm interpreting it correctly. I did, well, I'm sitting here went and look at the 10 by 10 map to see the um, new numbers that were released today for communities. And it looks like Waterbury went from 15 cases last week to 19 cases this week. Although there's a bit of a lag in the data because the maps are current as of Wednesday and now it's Friday. Um, but because that dot is red on the map where Waterbury is, is it safe to assume that that, that red dot is saying that the cases in Waterbury were associated with the hockey outbreak? Yeah, Lisa, so good question. Just to clarify, this, you know, these dots that are on the map are from October 7th. So they're all the cases that are associated with the outbreak. So that could be a recent case or okay. could have been a case the week of the 7th. So I wouldn't read into that. Um, I wouldn't read that conclusion into that. Okay, so it sounds then like of the 19 cases that Waterbury has had, it looks like um, not necessarily a certain number. Um, we've had some of our cases then have been connected with the, the hockey outbreak. Right, I think that's a fair conclusion. Okay. Um, and given the fact that the numbers that are out of the map um, as of today were from Wednesday, and we have a bit of a lag, is, I'm just wondering if Waterbury is sort of on your radar as a place where you're seeing additional community spread, just given what we've sort of seen this week sort of slowly uh, developing here. I can answer, I can answer no on behalf, on behalf of Dr. Kelso and Dr. Levine. All right, well, thanks for clarifying on the, on the dot and the, the, the timing of when, the, um, when these numbers are increasing here. It's kind of hard to sort of match all these different sources up and, uh, and sort of figure out what the timelines are for some of these things. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Tim, from On Business Magazine. Hi, it's Michael Pichek is still there. I wanted to ask about the uh, frontline employees hazard pay grant program. I know it, it opened up on the 28th and it was first come first serve and I was wondering how that was proceeding and um, when the individual could expect, I know there's a process here that's go through the company, and the individual, when the individual might actually start seeing uh, the money. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Tim. So the um, application portal did open up on Wednesday at 9 a.m. and we had significant interest from 
uh, businesses. They, um, we received 750, approximately 750 applications, uh, totaling requests of about uh, 26.6 million, um, 21 million for current employees, 5.5 for former employees, so quite a number of former employees as well. Um, so that exceeds the appropriation, but I want to make clear that you know, that doesn't, just because they've requested it doesn't mean that they'd be approved. So we are continuing to encourage people to apply uh, to the program. Um, additionally, we have uh, 1.5 million that have been approved already in the first two days. Uh, probably additional millions over the weekend uh, and into next week. And for those that work for an employer, they probably uh, can anticipate their employer receiving a payment over the next two weeks. And then the employer has to put that into their payroll, whatever that process is. The former employees can expect to receive an initial outreach from us uh, over the next week or so, and there are follow-up steps that the former employees have to follow, um, but they should be on the lookout from, uh, for a letter from us uh, over the next week to 10 days. Uh, it sounds like it's going uh, uh, pretty quickly in all of that. And how, how, how long do you think it'll take to clear you know, the $26 million to make sure that that's all set? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, we have a, a really great um, team at the Department uh, of Financial Regulation, you know, also in consultation with the Agency of Human Services. Both teams have been working really hard on this. They're working uh, over this upcoming weekend uh, to clear out some of that. We anticipate that over the next two weeks, they'll have worked through the vast majority of it. So um, they were able to get right on it on Wednesday, um, and they'll continue to you know, continue to uh, work hard. The difference between the first round is that we did receive a lot of applications that are smaller, uh, so there'll be a lot of smaller applications to get through. So the volume will be higher in terms of the number of applications we'll have to work through. All right, great, thanks, Michael. Liam Elder Connors, VPR. Hi, uh, Dr. Levine, you mentioned that you were on a call yesterday with a number of other uh, health commissioners in the Northeast, and you said some of them were um, going to be recommending to their governors uh, additional restrictions. So I'm wondering, um, have you recommended any additional uh, COVID mitigation restrictions to Governor Scott uh, in the last couple of days? Actually not. Um, you know, and just sort of thinking about what we know about the virus, um, you know, at the top of the press conference, uh, speaking about how people can be asymptomatic um, or go for a couple of days without having symptoms that still be infectious. So, you know, as we know there is sometimes a delay in sort of tracking the, the spread of these cases. And, you know, looking at what we now know about the central Vermont outbreak and sort of how that seeded so much of the activity we're seeing. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering what level of concern are you at about the way the virus is spreading? I mean, this, this press conference in the last couple of days have felt more like we're in March than, uh, than we were, you know, back in August or so when things weren't as bad. So, you know, what level of concern are you at and at what point would you be uh, recommending additional restrictions? Sure. So one of the things that we've noticed in the data currently, um, and this has been especially apparent in some of these sub outbreaks of the original outbreak, um, is that many of the new cases were actually already contacts. So they've been in quarantine, and presumably because they've adhered to quarantine are really uh, of no uh, threat to anyone else in the community because um, they're out of circulation during that time. So some of them we've actually known have been asymptomatic um, and then obtained a test because they developed some symptoms. Uh, but fortunately they developed those symptoms in a quarantine setting. So that's the way things are supposed to work and that's what containment is all about. So that's been very reassuring to us, if you will. And if you go back to the beginning of the Central Vermont experience uh, with the, di the three different leagues uh, at the Memorial Civic Center, you know, we're, you know, we're not seeing new cases amongst that cohort of individuals. Um, it's all this more downstream effect. Uh, so 
Um, and when we've seen some uh, of these very, very small uh, school settings and uh, workplace settings, they've all been very small and nothing has come from them in terms of other uh, spread throughout other aspects of their communities. So all that's kind of reassuring and in, in many ways this is behaving like some of the outbreaks we've discussed here since March. Um, even though it's of, of a decent size at this point and it may look to the observer that gee when is this going to end but knowing the incubation period of the virus you know it takes time as we've said. Um, we, we don't close out an outbreak until it's gone through those two uh, incubation periods without any additional cases. So I, I did show uh, a little bit of what we call the epi curve last uh, Tuesday and even though um, it, it's not quite where we want it yet you could see that there uh, is a plateauing at least um, and hopefully that will lead to a tailing off eventually uh, of that and that will be reassuring. So I don't think, you know, statewide, as the governor said, he's, he's been comforted by some of the data on statewide testing in the last couple of days. Um, and, you know, we would hope that would evolve into a trend. And that's what we'll be watching very closely. But we do like to be anticipating problems and making recommendations uh, for tightening things up ahead of time, not looking through the mirror af afterwards. But I don't think we're there at this point in time. I, I think we're, uh, we're in a state where we don't have to um, get overly alarmed about uh, uh, going backwards, as the governor says, or, or tightening anything in terms of restrictions. Um, it's more what we've been doing, which is trying to make sure that we anticipate things like holidays, especially the one coming tomorrow, but then the ones coming in November and December, uh, just anticipate those knowing human beings are human beings in trying to encourage people to try to be conscientious and do the right things so we don't have to worry about numbers increasing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Hadley, the Valerie Porter. Hi, Governor. My question is related to something that happened in the Mad River Valley community. Um, the other day on a local social media platform, an out-of-state part-time ski patroller mentioned that they are looking for weekend housing in the area, meaning that that employee plans to travel in and out of Vermont regularly without uh, quarantining. So, my question is, when will the state release guidance for ski area operations, and how detailed will that guidance be regarding part-time out-of-state employees? Um, well, two, two parts to the question, I guess. First of all, um, we'll be issuing guidance on the ski areas next week as well. Um, we're 99% we're there, and we'll be releasing that. Uh, in terms of the, the employee, uh, that's up to the employer uh, and, uh, and they should uh, make sure uh, that they are coming from a safe county and then um, hopefully in the next uh, month or two uh, we will be seeing more safe counties around the region and if they're, if they're coming from a green county that's perfectly uh, acceptable. Uh, if they're coming from a red county, uh, not so much. Um, they would have to adhere to the guidelines. It wouldn't be, they wouldn't be deemed an essential employee from my standpoint. All right, thank you so much. Greg Sikanek. Uh, Governor, can you, you can hear me? We can. Okay, good, thank you. Um, Lisa took my skiing question, so uh, thank you, uh, Lisa. Um, uh, glad that we'll be looking forward to those to those guidelines next week um, here at Ski Country. Um, so I was wondering perhaps if we could talk a little bit about COVID fatigue and how the state uh, gets around that because we've, we've heard this a couple of times and uh, you know I can imagine that you don't want to hector folks and or brought these people into, into compliance because you know, there's hesitance on that. 
Uh, but obviously, it's, it's pretty important uh, given what we learned today about the uh, the way that the um, uh, hockey uh, the civic center outbreak spread. So, uh, are there any can you have any ideas about sort of how to change messaging or how to uh, what we what uh, say leaders can do to try to work around COVID nineteen as we sort of you know approach this really important phase in, 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 in the pandemic and, and the threat of, of, a, of another, another wave. Yeah, and we'd be uh, open to any suggestions or ideas from anyone uh, on how to prevent the pandemic, um, you know, fatigue that we're seeing. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say as well uh, that uh, every time I go into a different establishment, go into a store, and see so many people wearing masks, uh, I'm, um, it, it gives me hope uh, that we can get through this. It becomes more routine. And I think as well, we as uh, individuals, as leaders, as family members and friends, uh, we need to lead by example. Uh, and we need to, to make sure our friends and family members are doing the same. Uh, because if we, if we do, I mean, it's just, it's, it's somewhat frustrating in some respects because this is really pretty simple. Um, and, and it's all individual. And we, again, have a, each have a role to play in this. And if we play the role well, we'll get through this. And, and we'll just have to continue to make this routine, not give up. Uh, because we've seen the benefit. I mean, we've seen here in Vermont, uh, again, comparing to other states. Like right now, I, I use this example. Um, I've used it uh, throughout uh, the last couple of weeks. But when you look at Wyoming, uh, smaller than population-wise than Vermont, uh, they had another 350 cases yesterday. 350. You know, we uh, we had um, in the in the teens uh, yesterday, and and we thought that was, you know, probably too many in some respects because throughout uh, the last uh, month or two, we've seen low numbers in the in the single digits, and and that uh, we've become accustomed to that. But again, compared to other states, we're doing remarkably well. But we have to keep it up if we want to maintain that. But we also have to pay attention to the region, as we said right from the very start, right from the beginning. Uh, that's going to be key uh, because we have a lot of visitors uh, from Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and, and New Hampshire. Um, so um, what happens in their state uh, has an effect on ours. So again, we need to continue uh, to get the message out. Um, we're relying on the media and all of you who are listening in right now to get that message out as well. Each and every one of us should be a role model. Okay, uh, moving on, Greg, the County Courier. No, I'm good. Hi, Governor. Um, I, I did have a question prepared, but it seems like I might not have all the facts ready for you. So I, I think I'm going to hold off till Tuesday for the sake of time and uh, appreciate the chance. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. Avery Powell, WCAX. Avery? Hi, can you all hear me? We can. Great. Um, I have a first quick sort of clarification question from Governor for the presentation. Should fly deck to 57 cases connected to the outbreak in, uh, in Central Vermont that be at 79? What is it? Yeah, I, we're, I'm hearing maybe every third word. Uh, could you repeat the question? Sure. I have a quick clarification question for um, Mr. Pizza. He said in the presentation that there are 89 cases connected to Central Vermont, oh, but yeah. the slide deck says 87. Yeah. Okay. Which one is it? Sir Pizza. Yeah, thanks, Avery. So the number that we have today that's confirmed is 87. I think there are a few probable cases that uh, haven't been confirmed yet um, through other tests uh, and the like. So. Uh, we'll get those confirmed when they become ready and uh, and if they turn out to be cases. Okay. Um, my full question is uh, travel border, cross-border travel. 
between uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. Grafton County right now is listed as yellow in New Hampshire. We've spoken with a lawmaker in Thetford um, and some parents there who are concerned that their children won't be able to participate in bordering ski programs in New Hampshire. Um, is that true? Will they not be able to go over to New Hampshire without quarantining after at this point? Yeah, obviously we're aware of the situation um, and we'll uh, take a look at that. Uh, but and I'm sensitive uh, to that cross-border type of relationship, and and the community goes uh, beyond the border in some respects. So we'll do whatever we can uh, to assist. Uh, but there are those types of situations all up and down the border on both sides of the state, and probably and down in the southern part. And then if the Canadian border were to open up, it'd be on the on the northern side as well. So we're always impacted by those situations. And if we made exceptions for every single case that comes up, um, we might as well just throw out the travel policy altogether uh, because it would be ineffective. So again, while we're sensitive to this, um, we put the policies in place, the travel restrictions in place for a reason. Uh, and if we see uh, the number of cases growing in another state, uh, there's a reason that we should uh, put those, make sure they're adhered to because we don't want the spread to come into our state. Simple as that. But in this one situation, we'll take a look and see if there's anything we can do uh, to help the situation out. And there currently are some Vermont counties which are either at or higher than the 400 per million threshold. So how, what's the justification for not allowing it in New Hampshire but we have these counties in Vermont? That, well, that we, we're, we're not going to kick one of our own counties out of state. Uh, we want to keep them here within our borders. So we've accepted from the beginning that we have, to, you know, we are what we are. And uh, what we're trying to do is prevent more from happening to us by allowing more to come into the state okay, in those areas that we know are, are, um, are, are problematic. So again, we, we know we have situations. We know our communities a little bit better than we know their communities. Um, so it does make a bit of a difference. Um, so um, again, it's uh, it's just what we did from the very beginning. Thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, DT Digger. Hi, uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, you were asked what officials might do about the situation. It's like Ridge, assuming there are no criminal violations, and you said, um, you know, what would you have me do? Do you think this is an appropriate case for prosecutors? I think I think it's up to the prosecutors, and I'll leave it to our commissioner to maybe answer that. But uh, but obviously up to the the state's attorney um, to determine that. The reason I'm asking is because you did push for charges against Jack Sawyer um, back in 2018. He was yeah. I, that was, I I don't know. If, yeah. I think as you might recall in the affidavit, um, there was an explicit plan in place to do harm to the school and the, and the members, the students in the school. It wasn't a question of if, it was a question of which day. And uh, he had a hit list. I'm, I'm not, uh, I guess, to, to compare the two, I'm, I'm not sure is fair or accurate. What would it take then for, for this? If you have, Ann, if you have, if you have information um, to the magnitude that we saw with Jack Sawyer, uh, you should present it to us about this about this case. If you have some sort of uh, detail of a plan uh, against to harm uh, a Vermont or or take take. Um, a plan in place to do harm to others, you should present it. We have not seen that that I know of at this point in time. And again, I'm just saying it's not the same. We we saw what was happening with Jack Sawyer, and I'm not sure that it's the same in this instance. But if someone has the information that would uh, that would that would, they would provide, uh, then we could take action. Who should they provide it to? Uh, you can, you can, Call, call the uh, Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, call your local law enforcement. Call someone and provide that information. If you have it, and you should provide it. Okay, thank you. 
I'll, uh, and it's Mike Sherling. I'll just answer the a question. Uh, I think we spoke briefly a couple of days ago about extreme risk protection order. If there's a person who believes that they're in danger or has a fact pattern that would rise to the level of the issuance of an extreme risk protection order, then uh, they'd have to file an affidavit with the court in order to get that. Um, so that's the that's the underlying um, process by which that would happen. If the person who they themselves believe they are in danger. Correct. As we discussed a couple of days right. ago, in, in Vermont, the state brings criminal charges so that people don't have to do that. Uh, they only have to act as witnesses, provide uh, accurate information in support of uh, an investigation, and then the state chooses through law enforcement and then ultimately through a, a state's attorney and then a judge uh, concurring with a, a finding of probable cause. Um, for uh, risk protection orders, you can actually go direct to the court, much like an abuse prevention order, file an affidavit and a judge will make a direct uh, determination whether there's a risk and uh, foundation for issuance of that order. Okay, just for the record, this is Ann Wallace Allen and that was probably Ann Galloway, but yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I only heard Anne. Apologies. <laughs> yep. That's right. Thanks. That should do it for me. Thanks. <clears throat> Andrew McGregor. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Um, this is for Dr. Levine or perhaps Secretary Smith. I'm wondering, are we testing at full capacity and at full effect to identify the virus in general communities? I'm wondering if, for instance, our pop-up test sites that rotate through are utilized in all available spots. And has any consideration been given to randomized testing within communities like they do at the colleges, healthcare facilities, and other sites? I'll start out with that question and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine if I, uh, if I leave anything else. Um, we're always looking for opportunities to expand our testing and in fact I think um, we're looking at those sort of surveillance testing opportunities as we speak. Uh, as you know, we, we're doing tremendous amount of uh, testing in what are called pop-ups. Now we're moving those sort of inside now at, at various uh, district offices and other places as as the weather turns. But you also remember we're doing we're doing a tremendous amount of surveillance testing in long-term care facilities, uh, staffing at uh, all sorts of congregate settings, including corrections. Uh, in those sort of things. But we are going to be looking at how we can expand our surveillance testing in, in communities. We haven't dropped off uh, our testing. In, in fact, if you look at sort of the testing with the colleges that's going on, we're at, I, I think I can safely say we're averaging over 25,000 tests a week in the last few weeks. Um, so. The testing, you know, is going on at a rapid pace as uh, as we move forward. Dr. Levine, did I miss anything? Okay. He says I covered everything. Do you have a, another question? Um, on a quick follow up: the, the pop up. I see that scheduled just through next week, and you mentioned moving indoors. Is, is there a commitment to continue with sort of the the rotation that's been established by town? That's just, looking for new sites? Yeah, I think there's a commitment to even expand our uh, testing capabilities as we move forward. Yes, um, we're going to be moving and making sure there's geographic location as well as, you know, hard to get to populations in, in our uh, testing. But um, the governor's been very, uh, very clear. He wants more testing um, available for Vermonters at Vermonters convenience not at um, at our convenience but at Vermonters convenience and we're going to do that okay thank you Alex the journal opinion yes hi hi Alex I can follow for secretary Smith um, but I'm, I'm and the plans for a secure juvenile facility in Newberry but uh, kind of guidance are you looking for from the legislature to move forward with the Beckett contract by January 1st?
Thank, thanks for the question. As you know, we have uh, uh, we have certain oversight responsibilities from the legislature. We it, we held a meeting yesterday to go over the um, for those that don't know. Um, uh, the Agency of Human Services through the Department of uh, Children and Families has a long-term plan, uh, plan for a juvenile-involved youth. Uh, it's basically a, we're working on a plan for a architecturally secured six-bed residential treatment facility for Vermont youth in the custody of DCF. Um, and that is a slated uh, for Wells River in a uh, 280 uh, acre property. It is a former uh, bed and breakfast facility. It's a large three level building in DCF and Beckett, which we would be contracting with. It would be operating that secure six bed residential treatment program for our target population. We have several uh, steps that the legislature has laid out yesterday. We presented one of those steps and uh, and there are they d delayed a decision on that step until um, until November mid-November I believe and then it goes back to joint fiscal my understanding the one thing that I want everyone to know we current we do need a residential facility like this because we have closed down Woodside and so we're moving forward with a residential facility uh, like the one that we presented yesterday. Did I answer your question? It does. If I could be permitted one, one related follow-up. Um, is, is there any plan to engage the community in Newberry and Wells River about projects? Yes. Yes. Uh, there, it, yeah. Yes. There has to be a, um, a plan. And, my understanding is there's been a preliminary engagement with the community, but um, we, we will, uh, I'll make the commitment here, I'll make sure that DCF does uh, engage in local leaders as we, uh, as we place this facility. Great, thank you so much, Secretary. All right, uh, Stuart Ledbetter. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor, uh, an easy one. Have you made your decision for president? I have not voted as yet. I plan to vote uh, either on Monday or Tuesday. Um, and that's to be determined. So uh, I'm not ready to tell you how I'm voting, but uh, I have made a decision. And I'll be voting on Monday or Tuesday. Thank you. All right. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all again on Tuesday. Thank you.